Um, so for the sake of the record, um, we had this file bit was a it was a Ken creation. Um, and I wish I could I wish I could claim um, the, the design because I uh, when I gave my presentation several years ago on uh, the special uh, synergies of 3D printing and assistive technology, this was the number one thing I brought up because it is so smart. And so um, so so simple to print and so inexpensive uh, that I took I must have taken oh got 500 of them or more to the conference and gave them and said take a handful. Wow. Yes. And so a coworker of mine was in your session, brought it back, and um, the reason this came back across my so just for the. I know this is lovely. I don't have a good background for showing things. Um, it's a like 3D printed zipper pull. And the reason I'm trying to find the file again is because our stash is running out. I don't know what I did with the print file. And I was in a high school um, health professions class last week. And so I talk about, I'm an OT. So I do like an intro to OT and everything we are. And then I do a brief intro to assistive technology. And I talk about the maker movement. And I take these because they're so, again, like Ken said, small, quick to print, easy to print. And it, it's really a powerful little tool when I'm talking to these high schoolers, you know, to say like, this is one little thing that takes 10 minutes to print, I don't know, 15 on mine. And um, this year I actually, there was a student in there who's involved with the maker group at her high school and her eyes lit up and she went, we could be doing this with our 3D printer. And I'm like, yes. Um, so I just want to be able to print more of them. Cause like Ken said, it is a, it is a powerful demo piece, I should say. So I put the link in the chat. Thank you so much. And I was going to email you and then I went, oh, I'll see him next week on Zoom. So I will pick his brain then. Thank you so much. No, oh, and thank you. So, yeah, so I am going to, uh, I am going to make sure and get some of these printed because we have a conference coming up and I want to do just what Ken did. Not, probably not hundreds because I don't have, a, um, a printer myself, but I have a grandson who does. <laughs> they print fast, I will tell you. Yeah. Yeah, so you print, you can print 20 of them at a time. Nice. <clears throat> and so tell me, Ken, what, what, um, what's the material that you use? I, so, Am I going to plug the workshop I have coming up in April um, okay. through also through Assistive Technology Conference of New England, but it's virtual uh, and it's it's a 3D printed key guard soup to nuts. So it's a three hour presentation. Um, I make no money off of it. Uh, the fee for attending is uh, $75 per person or per session, I guess. Um, but in that presentation, I'm going to say, uh, just to set everyone's expectations, I'm not going to talk about filaments. However, you should be printing in PLA unless for some reason you can't print in PLA. It won't get the job done. Everything okay. should be PLA. So for example, you can't do this in PLA, all right? But there's another filament that you can do this with. So you can have a batch of TPU somewhere and, um, in fact, I started getting TPU in just a variety of colors just to show that it can be done in colors just like PLA can. Um, but between those two filaments, I've never had to really print in anything else. Okay. And I've ne never had to worry terribly about a safety data sheet. Unless, unless the, TPU, the TPU is supposed to be non-toxic, but you know, I worry about anything that's made with petroleum products. Uh, and that's everything as far as I know, except PLA. So are you saying PLA can be used without a vent? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Now, there, there are some people who are super, super sensitive to smells and things. So even even uh, PLA has a smell when printing. But it's 
it's not terrible. Um, in fact, the guy who who reacted to I did this in a school setting once, and the person who reacted uh, came in much later, and I think it had kind of collected in the room a bit the smell. Uh, but it's made from cornstarch, so oh. um, so it's you know there are still micro particles. I would I I tell everyone you know don't sleep with your printer printing. Uh, if you're in a school setting, put it someplace in a separate room. Uh, it's not just the the filaments that could be problematic, but it's you know if you get your tie caught in there for all those kids who still wear ties at their private schools uh you know you could get wrapped up in it and who knows it could be uh could be uh you know america's funniest home videos kind of thing but um it, it's got hot components so you you just want it's better to keep it away from kids put it on a webcam something like that yeah, that i get so i had a guy who wanted to put one in his office mm -hmm. and i said don't do it you know, because you're going to be in there and they need venting. So if they don't need venting and if he's in his office six hours a day, is that reasonable? I, first of all, I'm guessing he's not printing six hours a day. Right. But if he's doing a six hour print. If he's doing a six hour print, again, I don't think it's, for, for example, I've got mine printing right now. There it is right there. Uh-huh. It's printing for another conference. And um, I'm, this here. Um, I'm printing PLA. And I, I guess I don't worry about it personally. I, I certainly don't worry about any volatile chemicals because it doesn't have those. Okay. Uh, there's still, I guess, a concern about microparticles that could be um, released during the printing process. Uh, but it's not like I'm printing um, ABS. Okay. Or something that gives off what are those nasty chemicals that they embalm people with, but gives off that kind of stuff while printing. That you have to be sure to vent. But I don't know. I don't personally know anyone who prints with ABS anymore unless they're replacing some car part. Okay. All right. So, uh, Lori and Jennifer, you both uh, have yours unvented and just around and no problem. No, I wouldn't say it's unvented. It's in a very well vented room. It's also enclosed with, oh. a fan, with a fan. So I'm a little different. And this is the safest place to put it in my building because we can close our doors. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I'm also not printing massive things yet either. So. And you, you say you have a, you have it in an enclosure. I'm sure that that came with it. And yeah. And you have a fan on it. Now, where does the fan vent to? Or do you have some HEPA filter or something? No, it's it vents into this room, but I'm only printing PLA right now. And okay. if it's something really big, I print it overnight. I haven't, I'm very odor sensitive. I haven't noticed any odors from it. Um, again, it's PLA and not ABS. ABS, I would never print during the day. Okay, and so you you have the fan on to what may manage temperature inside the enclosure or what? Temperature and, and vent it, you know, vent okay. the heat out, of, vent the heat out of it, okay. uh, you so, know. So it's a heat thing still, not a not yeah. a particle not a micro thing. Particle. No, it's not a micro. No, no, no. It's it's a it's a little digi lab from Dremel. It's nothing out there in left field. Okay. So. And we're, I mean, I'm printing on a MakerBot. It is not enclosed, yeah. and it's not. I mean, it's in a. Um, our AT room. So generally, here. For anyone, no one's in there. My students will use that as a work area sometimes, but we haven't noticed any problems. Um, on Lori's recommendation, I've put a Dremel on my wish list. Um, because <laughs> it's a we also have a lulls bot that is giving me ulcers. Mm. Um, and so I'm looking to replace it with something that I can actually use because while the lulls bot will do other materials, we've had no luck getting it to successfully do squat for us. So even, right. even contacting their service department. Uh, okay. Minimal help. <laughs> okay. And okay. It, and and I've got great help. So, yeah. Yeah. And if you don't want to spend thousands of dollars on your printers, um, I don't have then, it. then, uh, you can get a great printer 
for much less from Prusa. Mm -hmm. I have, I have looked at those too, but Lori was such an evangelist last month. Um, and well, honestly, because it's enclosed, my personal preference is I want to buy my a person, person for myself, but that'll be at home. Um, I have to have it enclosed here. It's not an option. Yeah. And I, I, my main concern for me is because I'm in a, I'm in a university OT department is also being able to get students up and running on whatever we have quick and easy with minimal support um the maker bot i mean it's got its issues and lord knows their customer support is in my experience not stellar mm -hmm. but we've been able to fix everything you know like it's it's very novice friendly and i have new novices every year mm -hmm. and i would claim i would claim that the current Perusas are novice friendly mm -hmm. i'll put that on my wish list too look yeah no you, just, no that's a great more printer. space i'll take them all ken and we'll figure it out but it is that's it is great printer. It is, yeah it's by far the best of the um what is it uh of the there's gosh there's a name for it non-commercial so for right. for personal use yeah. um not not something you'd find in a in a um, factory somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, it's the best of those. It it's um, tech. Its tech support is stellar. Okay, they're, so I'm gonna nice I'm people. gonna I'm gonna ask Jennifer to unmute and <laughs> give us her two cents because clearly it is uh, no looks like crossing. Yeah, so no, can't hear you. <laughs> yeah um you know so jennifer say? commented in the in the chat yeah i that's what i'm that's what i'm reading so i just like uh i wanted to see if she had anything else to say um mm. okay now now can do this yep <laughs> Sometimes you can, sometimes you can. Um, so I have a Prusa printer at home um, that I just bought for my private practice and she's a huge pathologist. And um, I, my husband's an electrical engineer and we've always wanted one. And could, you, could you put your mic just a little closer or something? Cause it's hard to hear you for me at least. That's because I didn't have the right microphone selected. No, hey. there you go. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Um, <laughs> so, so I'm a speech language pathologist. My husband's an electrical engineer, so he supports all of my maker habits. And um, I, my private practice is really just fun money to go to conferences and do stuff like 3D mm -hmm. printing. And so we just purchased a 3D printer at the end of the year for tax purposes for write-off. <laughs> and um, he wanted to wait until we could purchase a nice consistent printer, not just a cheaper printer. Um, and so his preference was the Prusa. And um, he's sort of been teaching me. I've been on Ken's website and done tons of key guards and printing. Um, in fact, I just wrote a blog post, but I haven't posted it yet. So that'll be coming just on my, my beginner thoughts on, on 3D printing for people. Um, but um, we are using it so much for my main school job is, or my main job is in a school district. And um, we are using it so much for printing key guards. Um, so we just purchased one through the district and my husband purchased the, well, I purchased through my business, but he put together the kit. So Prusa send, sells two different options. You can put them together. And the benefit of putting it together is you understand how it works. And actually, I, and not to say anything bad about Prusa, but we had a motor that was bad. And so what worked through their tech support, they immediately sent us a new motor. But, you know, part of understanding how it all worked and taking the whole day to put it together was really helpful for him, um, you know, to just figure that out. Now at school, I'm not putting a Prusa printer together. I don't have the time and I don't know that I necessarily have the skill set or the desire to do it. Um, although he did say the directions were phenomenal and the supports for putting it together were great. Um, so we purchased the assembled version and we should be getting it in like two weeks. Um, and our, our, um, our, 
we will be putting it right in our AT office in the district. So um, at home, my kids love 3D printing. And so we've done a lot just as a family and we've really not had any concerns about them you know, with printing PLA, we've printed our Harry Potter wands and we've experimented and learned and, um, and they were designing stuff and doing stuff. Um, and we had it on our dining room table for the longest time. Um, but we wanted our own little maker space. And so we just bought like a countertop off of Facebook marketplace and we've got it all set up in the basement now with all sorts of other maker tools. So, um, that's sort of been our experience. But I, like Ken said, we print mainly PLA. Um, I have printed some flexible key guards with um, TPU and actually have, I, I, like I can think of just a, a number of reasons why I would want to print with that material. But those those are pretty much the two materials that that we've experimented around with and, and I've found useful for key guards. So you said you recently wrote a blog post about your printer experience. I wrote it last week, but I haven't posted it on my blog yet. No. But if you want to put a link to your blog sure. in the chat, then anybody who, you know, any of us or anybody who watches this could, could read that at some point in the future. Um, I think that the more perspectives, the, the better if somebody is, is, you know, thinking about these things. So. And, yeah. And Scott, the one thing I, I talk about in my presentation is the most dangerous thing I've ever found about 3D printing are the little paint scrapers yep. that are super sharp, that are supposed to be, there we go, that are supposed to be used to remove your print from the print surface afterward. If you're kind of in a hurry and you don't want to let it cool down all the way, which, which time it generally releases on its own, but people are out there trying to get that thing to release and Bam, it releases and also slides across the plate and cuts your hand. That's the most dangerous thing. And the Prusas come with a spring steel sheet. You print on the spring steel, you remove the spring steel, you go burp, burp, and everything falls off. Yep. Lori, that, that could not have been a better time oh, to get oh, cut. No, that was a screwdriver <laughs> through my oh, finger okay. trying to get the little, you know, the support thing out. But um, I learned a very valuable lesson because the Dremel has glass print sheets. And I didn't, you know, didn't know. You know, I'm trying to pop it off as soon as it comes out. Duh, if I let it cool, it just drops right off. Right. You know? But the scraper, yep, I sliced my hand up. I have I have leather gloves I wear now when I take things apart or pop the, uh, the supports out of things. And of course, I was in a hurry yesterday and it was a tiny little support who thought it would bite my finger, but it did. <laughs> uh, the nice thing about the Dremel though is that print plates are 24 bucks. So uh, the first one I cracked, you know, I cracked and dinted and dinged and I had some grant money left over. So I bought four more, <laughs> just put them in the closet. Sure. We have I, a, I like we have that idea of the flexible. I love the flexi, oh, but that's not an option. Well, now I'm just going to need one for home too. My husband <laughs> keeps going, do we need one home? I'm like, no, we have them at work. It's yes. And now I'm like, Oh, fine. Maybe that'll be this summer's project. Now we're redoing our basement. Jennifer's got me thinking maybe we just need to make a space for the printer in the basement. You guys are enablers, boy. <laughs> so, I want um, one from home, but my three cats, I, I worry about having an open one with my three cats. Yeah. They'll and just I, jump I, right in. I don't, I don't 3D print. Um, I, I just, you know, I, I keep thinking I'm going to uh, have Bill James do that for me. Um, but you know, I don't know. I, I, I might have to, I might have to dive in myself. Um, we just have to see what happens. I think in my experience, and I think maybe Ken has written about this too, like you want a printer that's consistent and that's what's really nice about the Prusa you're not you don't spend a ton of time mm -hmm. leveling the bed you don't like it just really prints very consistently and so for a novice to just be able to pick up and do it I mean you have to ha experiment around a little bit and understand you know some some of the how it works but it is just a really easy consistent 3D printer and I think for somebody who's new to it like myself you know like yes I have 
a great husband who can kind of mentor me <laughs> and, and do some of that stuff. But it, for the most part, like we haven't had to do a lot of that stuff. It just, it's mm -hmm. been a really nice printer. And, you know, I, I yeah, so I, I think it's worth investing the money in. It, even a thousand dollars is expensive. Um, it's not, you know, you're not going out and spending 20 bucks on something, but it's just, it's nice to have something that's consistent. And you have to, I think you have to have the mentality that you are going to mess up things. I mean, I have lots of key guards that I've messed up, um, but that's part of the learning process. And when you start to see that, you know, the, the PLA isn't super expensive and you're not really spending that much on a key guard, it's okay to mess things up. And a lot of times, like mm -hmm. just with, with using OpenS CAD with um, Ken's tutorials, I've tried different things, you know, like he's got such great instructions for key guards, but I just, I print stuff a little differently each time. I try a little bit different feature and now I've been able to figure out like what I really like and what I think would be beneficial to students and, you know, why I might use one key guard attachment method over another because I've tried a couple of them out. And so I think just, you know, going into it with that mindset that, that you're going to experiment around a little bit, you don't have to print everything perfect, you know, the, every single time. Um, I think that you just have to, that's sort of that maker mentality, you know, you're going to mess things up and it's not always going to be perfect. You're going to try things out. Um, that's what I like. The one knock I would have on the Prusa is that the bed at its major dimension is only 250 yeah. millimeters. So if you have a large iPad or tablet yeah. that you're gonna run into some issues that you can't print that key guard, at least not in one piece. And boy, it'd be nice to just do it in one piece. And that's why I also have a separate printer that has a 300 millimeter, which still can be can be small if you've got a really huge. Um, and it's, it's my understanding that Prusa is coming out with a larger model. Ooh. fairly soon but it's going to be expensive Ooh. because it's yeah. a whole different technology uh it's going to be it's going to be beautiful and wonderful and have multiple heads that are automatically changed and it's core xy um construction but it's going to be in the thousands now and I work in a larger school district. And so we actually have a, like almost every building has a 3D printer and we have a lot of different 3D printers. And I think now, I mean, for the most part, we will be able to print probably 99% of what we need on our Prusa printer in our office. But I do have options, um, you know, as far as going to larger printers in the district. And we also have maker spaces throughout our community. Mm -hmm. So um, there's options to take advantage of some of those. So I don't think you need to always buy the bigger or, you know, like the, the rare time that maybe you're going to do that, unless you're going to be printing like keyboard type key guards or, you know, something where you know you're consistently looking at those larger, larger prints. But like I said, I, I don't envision iPads getting all that much bigger than they already are. And it, you, the way we are using them for communication devices, uh, we already, like, we're we're buying more minis now than we have in the past because the new 10 inch screen for some of our really little kids is just too big to lug around. The iPad has gotten too big. And so, you know, the, we're not going with iPad pros for communication devices unless there's a motor or vision reason or, you know, something like that. So I don't know. I, I mean, we're going smaller with, with okay. oftentimes, you know, like I'm not going to have an early childhood kiddo or, a kindergartner lugging around a big iPad Pro <laughs> to communicate like that's bigger than them and doesn't even fit in their little backpacks. So yeah. that's where for our ambulatory kids, you know, we're going with the smaller devices even. Yeah, that's we're good. seeing more requests for minis here. Yep. Yeah. The funny thing is, is I have over 21s and we have someone in the 40s who's getting closer and closer to the iPad and we're gonna have to send them bigger because we can't get an eye, we can't get a true eye exam on them. We're like, okay. Ken, is this your upcoming conference? Yeah. Okay, yep. Great. Ken also has some um, 
of his conference presentations from like ATIA and some of that on his website too. I, they're not three hour ones like this one. So I think this sounds like a great workshop, but um, there's already a, quite a bit on his website. Say I'm a big fan, Ken. Oh, great. <laughs> that's good because I'm going Spend to- Spend hours I'm looking at your website. <laughs> that's good. I'm, I'm glad you, I, I hope you could, I hope you will be able to attend um, because uh, I'm going to be live printing a mini key guard uh, for an iPad mini only because I need to be able to get it done before the workshop's over and it's going to still be tight. But if anyone says, oh, that's unreasonable, it'd be nice to have somebody hop into a chat and say, oh, no, it's completely reasonable to do <laughs> iPad minis. Yeah, no, I love it. And we have a kiddo right now. So he is a kiddo that is trialing a um, the PRC, or not PRC, the Satillo, um I'm blinking on the name of it. It's their mini. I forget what it's called. Touch something or other, but it's their mini version. Their Nova Chat. No, Nova Touch Chat. Chat. It's not the Nova Chat. We're doing the iPad version of it. Touch and um, I was just over there. They We just got a key guard for the device and they have like these plastic brackets that move all around. And this is a kiddo, a kiddo that like, un, like, unhinges it all the time, but it's white. And I've printed all of our key guards in black and he has glasses. He just like, I think the black actually, like he can see like, and we've commented within our AT department about this, like it, the, it almost enhances what you're seeing on the screen. Um, it kind of brings it out, defines the box a little bit more. And he has this white one and it doesn't fit flat to the screen because of the way it hinges on and he like we have his his ipad mini from the district there too and he does so much better with that ipad mini key guard that we've 3d printed versus the one that we just got from satillo that's white and you know doesn't fit close to the to the screen and can be moved around and it just isn't as stable i like our 3d printed key guards on our minis way way better Hey, Jennifer, if, if you have time and are willing to contact me, and, uh, I would love to add support for this new tablet to the program, but it'll just mean getting some measurements. Well, this is an old version of it that he's oh, okay. trialing through the company right now, but as soon as he get his, gets his new one, I would be happy to, to do okay. that, Ken. Yeah, they just came yeah. up with that out with an upgraded version. Yeah. So I'm not even sure how the new key guard, if there's a different version of it, but like we have their new Via Pro too, a student that has their, which is their iPad Pro version. And it does still have those same sort of brackets that fit underneath the case and then hinges on. Yeah, that's so, their thing. Yeah. That's their thing. I don't like it though. Like our kids play around. Like we want those yeah. things like solidly on the screen so the kid isn't going to try to take them off and... So he's funny, this little boy, he, he actually has dwarfism and he's got these little like red glasses. He's just the cutest little thing. And he takes his nose and he tries to like stick his nose in between like the key guard to activate. Like he's just this curious little thing. And we just have to laugh that, you know, he's got to get every little body part touching that key guard to see what he can fit through that hole. <laughs> right now his favorite activation method is his nose. Hmm. It's great. All right. So, uh, Ken, before we kind of started, you said you had something you wanted to talk about. Yeah. Um, so I've been sitting on an email, well, posting from the quiet mailing list for a while. It was from um, Angela Albrigo, who I've worked with, but don't know how to pronounce her last name. And she said, I'm looking for a low tech communication tool that functions step. Oops. Yep. We lost you. <laughs> yeah, frozen. Dun, 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 dun. Oops. <laughs> Might be, maybe he'll jump off and come back on. Scout, do you work in the school system or do you have a private practice or where, who do you? So I work for Missouri Assisted Technology, the state tech state. act. State, okay. Yep. And where do you, in Missouri, and where do you live? 
Uh, I'm in Green Bay, Wisconsin. So mm -hmm. I work for the Green Bay Public Schools and then have my private practice. Mm -hmm. But I do a lot of consulting with our state AT Act program and with our Department of Public Instruction um, and trying to create more statewide supports. And we still have no Ken. So um, any, uh, any, anything else that, uh, any problems that people have? Uh, uh, oh, can you, can you hear me now, Scott? I'm I, I can hear you. Unplugging and replugging stuff. I'm <laughs> busy. Let me um, select that as my camera as well. Start the video. Can we do that? Oh, okay, great. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, hopefully I haven't screwed things up too much. Uh, I'm so she was looking for something that functions kind of like a step-by-step -step switch. Um, that's about the size of a deck of cards and could be mounted on the underside of a wheelchair tray. And I was thinking, I can, I can think of something that's about the size of a deck of cards. It's this. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so many people have them and they are, calling them a phone is really, uh, talking about them as if they're very little. These are the most powerful things, amazing. They have great recording capabilities, great sound capabilities. All you need to do is find a way, first of all, to connect a, a switch of any kind to it, whether it's a leaf switch or a pressure switch or whatever, right, Scott? You gotta connect a switch to it, and then you have to have software on it that supports either either accessing existing recordings uh, or that supports recordings on its own and is paying attention to the interface to the switch. So I'm assuming, and I did find some things that would connect to the, the um, whoops, wrong end, to the port on the bottom, you know, the charge port, the, um, there's a, it's a data port too. But anyway, could connect to this and you could connect the switch to it. Now the, so then the, the, the next step is you got to find software. That you could, a language you could write to create that software on this phone and you'd want it to be cross platform. So you'd want it to be both for, for um, uh, iOS. Is that the right term for, for yeah. uh, Apple phones and Android? So at least, support Apple and Android, so it's got to be cross-platform. So I don't know if this audience has familiarity with writing software for, for multiple phone device, phone style devices, but I'm, I would love to find a, a cross-platform uh, kind of software that I could use to try to write that, that program for this phone, because, and mounting, my God, there are lots of ways to mount a phone. So, Everything is right here. The family or the kid probably has one of these. And now, and the rest, the, the other part of it is just closing a circuit that looks like an input to the phone. But that software is the part I don't have a clue about. So unless anybody else here has a way to do that, I mean, the, the, the place that I have seen um, people talk that language is the Facebook group that Bill Binko uh, runs. And I mean, the I would think somebody there would be your contact since nobody here is jumping in saying, let me, let me take that off your hands. <laughs> well, have you heard of action blocks within Android phones? So um, the they just released and um, Charlie Danger out of the UK has posted on action blocks. I don't know like access wise, cause I'm not an Android user. Um, I'm not sure access wise if it's accessible with a switch, um, but I know like you can actually like on the home screen of like your, 
your device that uses board maker symbols even, you can um, create what are called action blocks. They can be a variety of different sizes and customized, I believe, and you can program it to speak out loud and say things. So it works, it's just built into the settings, accessibility settings of Android phones. Um, so Charlie, if you just Google Charlie Danger and Action Blocks, I'm sure you'll find some of the stuff that he's posted on that. Or I think there's probably other people by now that have done it as well. Um, Cough Drop is a good communication software that's already created and they have a monthly, um, I think it's like $4.99 a month, um, or you can pay like an, a lifetime license of it. Um, and that's fairly, um, affordable and that's cross-platform as well and I mean it can be as robust as you want it to be I mean it, it's really it's it's an augmentative communication app much like lamp or touch chat or whatever but what's nice about that is when I have families that want an Android device or a Kindle or something like that to be a communication device, cough drop is one, even like on student Chromebooks, we can use cough drop. Um, it, it really is very functional with a lot of different platforms. And then you, I know have used um, the GoTalk Now app. They also have a free version. I don't know that it goes on an iPhone though. It goes on an iPad, but if you had a mini, um, and that is accessible with like a Bluetooth switch as well. Um, so that's another one when I'm looking at switch users, I will often go with like go talk now if that and, and I think you get like five free pages with the free version of it. So and when you were talking about what Charlie was using, were you saying action black or action block? I, I... It's, it's blocks. Oh. I I know, has anyone else noticed how cool the uh, English uh, AT guys' names are? <laughs> Charlie Danger is just one of them. They all have these really cool names. I'm also curious because you mentioned when you read the request that they want a low tech. Yeah, that didn't make any sense. Well, I know of a. Go talk. And if you're saying a go talk, to me, that implies you're only recording one set of messages. Go Possibly talk to F5 one. levels, but yes. Okay. So I guess I think the other thing is when you think about a phone, um, as somebody who borderline hates to throw anything away, um, what about a old phone? Um, we kind of joke that my, my youngest child does not have a cell phone yet. What he has is an old cell phone that we now call the iPod touch. You can't buy an iPod touch mm -hmm. anymore. Yes, but, you can. Oh, you can now. Yes, you can. You can make an old phone an iPod touch that's, too. That's a great idea because the only, mm -hmm. the only, you don't need uh, calling capability. You don't need internet capability really though. You might be able to get internet if you were just doing Wi-Fi and not some sort of uh, I used I used an iPod Touch for three years in my AT job before I got an iPhone. So. Yeah, so but I mean you you wouldn't need the uh, the card that right. allows you to connect you to. The, you don't need the SIM, no. You, you don't, don't need, need the SIM the card, so you don't need the monthly cost. If somebody right. has an old phone, then can you you know figure out a way to make that work? And then boy, that's dirt cheap because it's someone's old yeah. phone. It should, it, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to make it work. The only catch on that is how old the phone is, because we have, um, as an example, we have iPad 3s here, and I can do nothing. They're video players, because I cannot download any software, apps, anything, because the apps are no longer on the iStore. I right. They're not compatible <clears throat> any longer. In right. So you phone. can't go too old. I right. can still download uh, apps onto my old iPod Touch, though, um, which stops at 12 so that's interesting because i my personal ipad is also ancient and it's a constant gripe of mine that i can no longer stream hulu because right. that's the app that died right that will not like update on there anymore right right but, um, i think yeah there's a sweet spot between old phone and too old phone um mm -hmm. And that's my gripe with my personal iPad. I'm like, but it still has a good battery life. It still does everything. I think else. you're okay up to iPad 5. So I would think iPad, iPhone 5s would still be. 
Bide's actually yeah. borderline. Yeah, okay, you're on the borderline. Yeah. So, but also the iPad minis, if, if they're going right. out of date for, for general use, they right. would work, they, they could work for this as well. Right. Until they're right. no longer Until supported. They're yeah. All right, great ideas. Yep, and uh, Jennifer is adding sounding board uh, to the app list. Cough drop is the only decent communication app I have found so far that runs on a Fire tablet, if anybody's got to use a Fire tablet. That's, um, they're really, yeah, the, I, the, big, I, the big ones don't run on Fire yet. Yeah, I, hi so. I highlight that Fire tablet on my my website because you can get a whole communication system with cough drop and a yep. fire tablet on sale for 80 bucks or something like that Yep. Uh, for cheap. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, Ken, and I thought you were looking for somebody to write software for you. For, for no, 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 yeah. no, no, I just a, just a language. Yeah, that, okay. Well, luckily Jennifer was not misled by uh, uh, hearing, so she got right on. All right. Um, any anything else that people want to talk about today? We uh, we are officially at time since we we officially say we're doing forty five minutes, um, but since we are a small group and have had plenty of time to chat, um, we could actually call it, or we could keep going if anybody has anything else they want to discuss. We say, Naomi, do you have anything um, you want to throw in? Anybody else? <laughs> Naomi is saying she's good. All right. Um, well then, um, I. Oh, so the what I wrote down today, and I I, I don't know if you know, is is there any is anybody doing anything in this group? about uh, ramps, about that for a, like, I have, I've been trying to think about, you know, like, is there any other way to make a ramp, whether it's a threshold, does anybody ever work with ramps at all? And a threshold ramp or a longer ramp, I tried rigid foam insulation, but cutting that at an angle um, was beyond me. I made a huge mess in my basement. <laughs> Um, how big a ramp right whether it's a threshold ramp or, or just I, a, I, a bumper okay i had this idea that i was going to make rigid foam insulation pieces that could go up a, a whole step um mm -hmm. yeah no it didn't it, you know mm -hmm. you gotta try <laughs> you gotta, you gotta. um so anyway that was my that was my like random question for the day so yeah please please uh expand on this so this is a ramp to take someone in a wheelchair up six inches or what yeah right that's, six that's inches. the height of the ramp uh, this that's the angle here or the, the what you're trying to achieve is a six inch lift yeah you could anything anything from one and a half to six you could 3d print something out of some you might need to go you have to reinforce it but yeah i mean you might be able to get you're only going six inches. Um, it was solid. So, yeah, so you're not you're not supporting the whole wheelchair for long. In fact, you're only supporting part of the wheelchair at any point in time. Right. Most of the time, it's on a different surface. Right. Um, so you know you might be able to just get a. I would I would make sure I was at a lower ramp angle than 45 degrees, maybe 30 or something like that, um, and just. Uh, Fill the heck out. Well, you know, you put lots of perimeters on it, and um, put yourself in the wheelchair, not the person who's going to do it, <laughs> and uh, and just try to go up that. Put make two of them. Try to go up, so, go up it. Yeah, right. And if you like, uh, if the wheels are in line, then you could do track ramps, basically. Right. Um, yeah, but what I was thinking is, is there a way to carry? a ramp, you know, for especially like a manual chair user, is there a way to carry a ramp to get over, to get over a step and then actually be able to put that down 
and use it. I don't know how you pick it up, but that could be worked in. Yeah. But, you know, because you, you, put, you, you put strings on them. Yeah. And, and uh, but yeah, the, they're not heavy. Whatever yeah. you're going to 3D print is not going to be heavy. So it'd be, if you'd have to have, you know, the range of motion to be able to reach down and put it down. Sure. Or, not for everyone. You know, not I mean, that's, everyone, but, that would be clear. It's not for everyone. But, no, but if they have an assistant too, I mean, if there's somebody who needs assistance, they'd have an assistant that yeah. could do it. Yeah, I bet right, you, but could then do you would be less likely to need. I mean, you could use track ramps then. I mean, metal track ramps mm -hmm. would, would, you know, if you have somebody with you, they could carry that likely. Um, you know, uh, Scott, just, thinking, like something you could pop into a bag on the back of your wheelchair. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is actually a perfect use for TPU because TPU is indestructible. Oh. Um, Needs to be vented though, big time. Well, what I, I print with TPU, no problem. It's, okay. it's, uh, it's non toxic. Um, but the beauty is it's, it's indestructible. So uh, you could, and depending on the infill pattern you used, you could make, you could control where it, how it compresses because it's a flexible filament, but you could control how it compresses. And you probably don't need to make them any bigger than the mud, the mud. Um, I call them mud blocks, but that's not what they are. They fold in half. They're red plastic. They're about yay, about yay big unfolded. And we put them under my tires to get me out of camp sites when I get stuck. Um, but even if you made them so that they would fold, I mean, I don't, I, I'd have to run to my car for them um, and dig maybe next time. But um, they wouldn't be very big and they aren't very heavy. I mean, they they could fit in one of my larger lunch boxes. Now, I don't know. I don't know about with the angles on them if that would, you know, with the with the the triangle party on it if that would work. But because it would need to be like a triangle piece. But yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting in seeing that. You know, to see if it was something. Um, Let's see if I can find them online and send you a picture. Hang on. So with the with the TPU, like if you did something kind of crosshatch su uh, uh, support, is that what you're thinking would be underneath? That would be the uh, the eternal um, right. structure of it. Yeah, um, you have to give it some thought how you'd want to do this. You could even build. You could even design in some internal supports. So um, when you create the the CAD design, you you could create um, some kind of internal walls that would that would be vertical and and provide additional uh, support against uh, compression. compression. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it it just be worth trying. And I would start with a what's a, what's your smallest um, jump that you're or lift that you're trying to get? Two inches, three inches. I mean, you know, um, just just as threshold, a threshold can be can be an inch, although that can usually be navigated without a ramp in a in a pinch, you know. Um, Let's say you went for two inches just, okay. just to see how it would be just as a first test. If you can't do the two inches, you're never going to get the six. Right. Um, but yeah, um, you know what? It, it wouldn't take that long to mock something up. Let me give it a shot. Yeah, if, I mean, and there's no, there's no uh, rush on it. I'm just looking at what, what. Uh, In neither of oh, these okay. are the ones I have. The one set is rigid and they are kind of long. The other set folds in two places. Mine just fold in half, but these are longer than mine. These are for, for great big, big trucks. I just have a little. Car. And these are these are for gripping. They're not for lifting per se. No, no, no. But I'm just saying that principle, that thought of a board like right. that size, then you could put the not using that board, but something that size. Does that make sense? Yeah, right. Just right, using right. it as a as a jump off point. Put it against the thing and get your angle or so. I don't know. No, and, but it's also an interesting. Uh, but they they are lightweight. Design. They are lightweight and portable. If you had to, you could backpack the foldable ones. You could probably backpack 
um, let's see how are they really big. Well, and even that, I'm just looking at that egg egg crate design. Yeah, yeah. Of the first one, yeah. So that's giving you the track better traction too. Yeah, I didn't look at the second one yet. Mine are oh, from okay. Walmart, so I mean, ink them up. Come on. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, it is. It is interesting. Um, I mean, as I long as you're not looking to jump eight inches, you know, more than than that, whatever that yeah. is. The average step is seven or eight inches. Yeah. If it's to, if it's to code, if it's to curb code. Right. The steps are seven to eight, but curbs are curbs generally are, more like yeah. Seven. Less, and, yeah. You know, again, I don't, I don't have a, I don't have somebody who's asked me for this. This is like, I'm always just. You know, oh, I can think of a couple people. Right. I it can think of a couple people that I used to, to, to service. Yeah. The, the trick is, you know, being able to put them down and take them back up, and that they're not so heavy that you can't possibly carry them on the back of your wheelchair or boot maneuver them. Well, and you know, even. Um, yeah, no. Thoughts, yeah. something to, to start engineering. Yeah, <laughs> another another road for Ken to go down. <laughs> You're welcome, Ken. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, um, we are at, at five till now, so uh, maybe I will, I will end us there or have Naomi end us there. Um, and say thanks for thanks for uh, coming today.